Welcome back to the Gem Cutters Craft. I'm your host, Justin K. Prim, and today we're gonna to be looking at one of the most important faceting designs for the early American gemstone cutting industry. My project for this year has been to deep dive into the history of the American faceting community. And one of the things that has kept popping up for me, one of the things that I keep encountering across America as I travel around is this early gemstone design that almost completely disappears in later American fasting history, but was seemingly very important for this early period. So I first stumbled upon this design looking at the gemstones of J. Harry Howard from the 1930s and onward. He often uses the same cut, which is essentially a round brilliant, but with a third tier added, giving it a star-like impression from the front of the stone, but essentially putting it into the family of almost Portuguese cut with its alternating indices. Now, at first I thought this was an anomaly. I'd seen it in several of the 1930s Howard stones, but it wasn't until I started to see the same pattern again in Montana and again in Maine, looking at the early cutting histories of those mining localities, that I started to think that, hey, maybe there's something to this. In fact, it's not even a lost cut. I have the design in my last year's book, The Secret Teachings of Gem Cutting, under the name Star Cut, a cut that I learned looking at Sri Lankan cutters in the Sri Lankan cutting industry. At that time, I didn't realize that this was actually a cut that came from early American pioneers like J. Harry Howard and the cutters that were up in Maine in the 1880s and 1890s. The design consists of a three-tiered top. So we've got main facets, break facets, and star facets, which is really just the regular round brilliant design for the top. And on the bottom of the stone, we've got eight main facets with 16 break facets, which is again, the normal round brilliant cut, but with the addition of a third tier, eight star facets that complement the star facets on the crown side. Not only is this an interesting historical cut, but I've come to believe through cutting it a bunch of times that this is actually a really, really good cut, one that every cutter should have in their arsenal. Now, the one thing that I always thought that the brilliant cut was missing was a balance for the star facets on the top of the stone. So when we've got light coming into the crown through the mains, it comes down and there's main facets, the pavilion mains underneath for the light to hit and mirror off of. The same can be said for the brake facets. There's 16 brake facets around the top of the stone and the light can come in there and go down and hit a complementary brake facet underneath. But if the light goes into the stars, the star facets that are around the table, when it comes in, there's no facet underneath of there that complements that index. There's only the mains that make up the culet point. So when we add this third tier to the pavilion facets, giving it essentially star facets around the bottom of the stone that now make up that culet facet, the top and the bottom of the stone are perfectly in harmony. Eight main facets, eight star facets, 16 break facets on top and bottom, and then of course there's a table. So this is now a completed idea. It seems really interesting to me that the early American cutters were fixated on this cut because we don't see it being used anywhere else. I don't see it in Europe. I don't see it in modern American cutting. It's just this one period between 1880 and about 1930 or so, maybe slightly later, but definitely before the 1950s. Earlier in the year, I came across this cut in Montana and I saw this necklace from 1910, which is full of Montana sapphires cut in this same three-tiered round brilliant design. Now the really cool thing about this design, you can use it for sapphires and it's a really nicely balanced cut with a nice reflection, but more importantly, you can use it for something like a morganite or a lighter pastel stone, even a rose quartz. And that third tier softens the profile of the bottom of the stone a little bit and allows the light to become a little bit more diffused inside of the stone, which actually will help increase color saturation on pastel stones. The Portuguese cut does the exact same thing and for the exact same reason. So many alternating tiers without a lot of extra facets and balance on the top and balance on the bottom means it doesn't give as much 
bright flash, bright reflection, but lets the light sort of spread out a little bit more and gives the stone a little bit of a softer but more saturated look, which is really important when you're dealing with a pastel stone like a morganite or a light aquamarine. Now in the stones that I've seen that belong to J. Harry Howard from the 1930s, he used this cut on almost everything. I've seen it on amethyst, I've seen it on sapphires, I've seen it on aquamarines. Some of the biggest stones that he cut were in this pattern. So I've been looking at it, focusing on it, and experimenting with it to see how it works in different situations. And so far what I've seen is that it's a really useful cut. Now, if you want to learn how to cut this early American pioneer cut, check out my book, The Secret Teachings of Gem Cutting. The second edition just came out and it's available on our website at magusgems.com. Look for the star cut and you'll be finding a variation of the same exact cut, the three-tiered round brilliant. I hope you enjoy the cut and I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you're really enjoying all the content that I've been putting out for free over the last so many years, please consider supporting me at my Patreon. Patreon is a great way for you to give a little bit of a monetary thank you and helps me to keep making these videos free and interesting. Feel free to check out some of my other videos on YouTube and I'll see you next time on The Gem Cutter's Craft.